Welcome everyone, Adam. It's a woo here. Coming to you from Los Angeles, California. Behind me is a familiar LA landmark, the Griffith Observatory. You have no doubt seen it in countless postcards, television shows, and plenty of feature films. But I'm here to ask the question, what's inside the Griffith Observatory? Now, I've been on this property before. I've wandered around the premises, but I have never dug deep into the nooks and crannies of what's behind the walls. Today, I want to do that. Join me, shall you? This has to be the most popular place in the city to get a good photo of the Hollywood sign. Now, there are plenty of places around town where you can get a good zoomed in shot. All the tourists flock up here stand on this little ledge and get their selfies and or photos. You can see there is quite the congregation of people waiting to go in. The doors have not officially opened yet. Very popular place. And we're about to find out why. One of my favorite pieces out here on site definitely has to be this bust of James Dean. There are two of these in existence. One of them in Fairmount, Indiana where he grew up, his hometown, and the other one perched up here on the side of the mountain overlooking that iconic sign, James Dean immortalized. Doesn't look too busy quite yet. Everyone's waiting to go inside. We kind of have the overlook all to ourselves. If you look off to the right, there it is. Downtown Los Angeles. Slightly smoggy today, but you can still see the silhouette of the buildings. From up here, you can really tell the vastness of greater LA and how far it stretches off to the left and way off to the right. Lots going on down there currently looking at Hollywood proper. All the hustle and bustle happening just down there. And as we veer this way, we get into the Hollywood Hills. Continuing on, a section called Hollywood Land. Designated that because the sign used to spell out that word, Hollywood Land. Of course, the land, the wording of land, not the actual property. The land is still there, but the word has been removed. Now it's just Hollywood. One thing a lot of people fail to notice is on the ground, there are these markings designating not only planets, but sections of the solar system. And it goes all the way across the property, way over there. Perfect example is right here in front of the entryway door states our sun followed by the orbit of mercury and venus i know this place the orbit of earth i'm standing right there and then of course mars and it goes on and on and on general overview of what's inside two levels and hours are as follows weekends they open at 10 a.m closed on Mondays and then Tuesday through Fridays. They don't open till noon. So you don't have to get up too early to come visit the observatory. Cost of admission, absolutely free. Now you will have to pay $4 an hour to park unless you take public transportation, an Uber, a Lyft, or get dropped off. But to enter in the doors, doesn't cost a dime. This is always fascinating to me. You look down in this little pit, you'll see a pendulum swinging. And if you look closely where the pendulum, the projected path, it knocks over these little teeny tiny metal pillars. So as it goes back and forth, depending on the projection and axis of the Earth, it tells us what time it is. It's an old school way of telling time before wristwatches, before cell phones. And it's connected to a large 
metal wire that stretches all the way up to the ceiling. In ancient times, people used myths to understand what they saw in the sky. The mural overhead was made by 1930s painter Hugo Ballin, illustrating those early stories used with a parade of classical figures. So cool. Right up there is Griffith J. Griffith, who we have to thank for the area that this now sits on. And there is a memorial here placed in granite. Griffith J. Griffith, donor of Griffith Park, the Greek Theater, and the Griffith Observatory. I highly recommend going inside the camera obscura room. It's an old school way of looking at the horizon. Look down there. You can see some vehicles. You can see some vehicles down here driving on the road. The way it works is up here are mirrors. So the mirrors shoot down the image from the top of the building down onto this. And we can see outside, we can see what's going on outside. It may seem like it depends on magic, but it's really simple piece of optical equipment. Oh wait, something's going on out here. This is a device that was invented in the late 19th century by Nikola Tesla. But there's one thing he did invent all on his own that is not talked about enough is a remote control robot. In 1898, he built a boat and was able to control it remotely and uh, was thought of as a gimmick in those days, but now we're opening up garage doors with them and, oh yes, controlling two rovers on Mars. Three, two, one. Okay, that concludes this demonstration. Thank you for listening. Enjoy the rest of your visit. Back to a little more detail on the camera obscura. It projects an image of the outside world into a dark room through a pinhole. And here is an example of how it works. It goes through here, shoots down onto there. So there's the outside, and that's what they are looking at indoors. If you stand in a certain spot right here and look up, you can see, oh yeah, there's me. Look at my face, it's like, it's showing all the heat. I'm look, I'm, I look like I can, I can use some hydration. Yeah, I look like I'm, my temperature is completely boiling. Here's a scale model of what we're currently inside. And if you press, press these buttons, it lights up the certain sections. This is called a triple beam cholestat. I'm pressing it down so it's lighting it up. Then we have the Focalt pendulum. Hit that. Okay, nothing's lighting up. The Focalt, oh yeah, it is, right down in there. Okay, that was that big ball that swings around and tells time. The Focalt pendulum. The changing direction of the pendulum swings reveals Earth's spin on its axis by using the control pad at the base this exhibit, you can turn and move the direction of the telescope. Right down here, you can point it and move the dome. So let's do a right ascension east. There it goes. It's completely tilting. There it goes. It's going eastward. Now I can close the dome. Let's go clockwise. You have, to, you have to be very patient, but you can see it. You can see it turning. They just made an announcement. They're going to do a presentation that only happens once a day, and it is taking place down on this little arch-like thing. The building itself is an astronomical instrument, and that's what really this is. Um, so the first part is this line here is called the prime meridian. That is the line that points exactly north and south. 
and uh, and so what we have here is a green, and we have this monolith here, kind of like in 2001, that foil, and a very high-tech device up there called the hole with the lens. And so what that does, at every day at what's called local noon, the sun hits its highest point by crossing your local meridian. This also relates to the term AM and PM. I hear that all the time. Oh, I got to get at work at 7.30 AM. Oh my God, I don't want to get up better. Well, AM and PM actually stand for something. Uh, and it stands for, it has to do with the meridian. So AM stands for anti-meridian, which means it hasn't hit the meridian yet. PM stands for post-meridian once it passes there. There you go, there it is. The sun is up right here. It is in the uh, big cast area. It's going to be moving towards the uh, forest. So right up here is where the sun is. That is the part of the sky. This is called the uh, ecliptic. That is the path of the sun. This only happens once a day, so I can't make this happen again. I could, but it would be a just disgusting display of power. So I, <laughs> the sun right now is at its highest point of the day. It doesn't get any higher than that. And during the equinox, as it rises in the east and sets in the west. So there you go. There you have it. That is local noon, and you got to see it. It became, uh, you know, a few minutes later. Maybe messed up. Speaking of the sun, this is a spectro helioscope. It's a special telescope that can observe any wavelength of sunlight. This one is tuned to let you see only the red light from hydrogen atoms. And you can see the beam is going down into that hole. And they have it set up. If you look down in there, you can see like some sort of tinfoil mechanism. And then over here is like a microscope. And if you look down in here, you can see you're actually looking directly, you're looking directly at the sun without hurting your eyes. Right there. This time lapse shows it turning bright and dark areas of the sun reflect differences in the temperature. As the sun turns, you can see eruptions. Pretty fascinating thing. Okay, you can just see it like bubbling and bursting all in there. That's what illuminates us every single day, so we can see as we go about our daily business. This list shows other stars. Ours is right here, that's our sun. You can see there, there are others that are much larger, including this one called a supergiant. And look closely at the specific name of it. Betelgeuse? It's actually called Betelgeuse. If you say that sun's name three times, you will be destroyed. A few different elements. We got Krypton here. It, by pushing it, it lights it up. Then we have helium that also lights up and the periodic table. And you can press different buttons down here that give you the formation and distribution. Like it shows you which of the periodic tables do certain things. Our bodies are made up of two dozen elements made of the same material that created stars. Let's press that. And there's the element. See, it illuminates what we're made of. Everything that's darkened is not part of our body. Now I'm gonna let go of the button and they all light back up. Changing of the seasons designated in this little section at the March equinox at the December solstice. The leaves are falling, the snow is starting to set in. And look up here. Look how quickly Earth is spinning around. It's just like rapidly moving. Time is, go is going at a very rapid speed. <laughs> time, time, time. See what's become of me. Showing how eclipses work. There we are up there, the moon spinning around us. Also a little more rapid than in real time. And that's the sun in the middle. So there's Earth, the middle-shaped circular sphere. The small circular sphere is the moon. And then the one in the middle is the sun. Wheel in the sky keeps on turning. Autumn equinox happens around September 23rd. 
approximately every year. This is what happens during the day. If you just wait a moment, it's gonna kick back into nightfall. I wonder what constellation we're gonna see. Place your bets. Pegasus. There it goes, way up there. Way overhead. There goes Pegasus. Goodbye, Pegasus. Heading downstairs now, there are two levels, two floors to this structure. You wanna see what's down, down here now. Ooh. There you go. There's an artistic rendering. The more I look at it, it might actually be a photograph that's blown up. I think, it, I think it's a photo, not a painting. I don't know, it's hard to tell. It really is hard to tell. Down this hallway, the right side is a, is a marble wall. The left side is a glass window adorned with jewelry. The jewelry consists of moons and stars and planets and it stretches all the way down till you reach the bottom floor. If you've ever wanted to know about meteorites, this is the place to be. Starting off with the California versions. Look at these things, that one's huge. The Bruceville meteorite, that thing's massive. And here's some smaller ones from Mars. These, these came down from Mars and this map shows all the different locations where they found impact all in the state. This 269 pound chunk of iron was found out in Arizona at the huge meteor crater. I've been there, I've stood at the top of that and looked down in it and they drug this thing out of the bottom of it. That thing is, oh yeah, heavy duty. It's allowed to touch a piece of Mars and the moon this is a piece of the moon right here. I'm rubbing, I'm rubbing the moon and now I'm rubbing a piece of Mars. And if you look down in here, check this out. You can get a, you turn this knob. I'm turning a knob and you're getting like a, a more detailed version of what the exterior of a meteorite looks like under a microscope. Cosmic rays are not rays at all, but they're high energy particles from space. Dozens of these rays pass through our bodies every second. And this mechanism is showing us what's, oh, it's sparking. Wait for it, oh, that's happening inside my body right now? Whoa, the cloud chamber, when a star explodes or the sun erupts in a flare, protons and electrons are blasted as cosmic rays. That's what's happening down in here. What the heck's going on down in there? The cloud chamber. Ooh, what just, something just bubbled up. That's so weird. Ooh. Okay, it's just, it turned on. It's like, it's like heating up or something. I hear like an engine roaring, moderate roar. It's like bubbling up to the surface. The cloud chamber has just been experienced. Against the far off wall, you see a bunch of galaxies and stars. That's not real, that's just an interpretation, but they do have all these different telescopes, different types of telescopes that you can look. Basically just stare you falling in love with the wall or something? Now I'm gonna pan out and I'm gonna utilize this piece of machinery and see if you can see. Yeah, look, there it is. There's a couple of them in there. Yeah, there's two different ones, one on the left and one on the right. Not bad. Our closest neighbor in space, the moon. There it is in all its glory. Look for these features on, look for these features on the moon model. We got Copernicus Crater. Yeah, right there. I see it, it just is passing by. And there's a chunk from the surface right there. That's from the real moon, not from a model. That's a model right there. That's, that's the real moon. That's no moon. It's a, it's a model. If you do show up out here, definitely make sure you go down to the bottom level. 
it is an easy mistake to avoid this not knowing it exists. But there's a lot down here on the bottom floor, so don't miss it, including selfie taking Einstein. Every time I see this guy, the way he's holding his finger, I know he's not doing it, but I'm just assuming you could put a smartphone in his hand and he would basically be taking a selfie. You got it, buddy? You got, you got it, buddy? Nailed it. You posting that on Instagram? All right. All right, I'll check it out later. In this room, not only do they have a, a globe that's spinning around, but also a seismograph which is used for researching, tracking, and letting us know about earthquake potential. Look down in there, you can see how the line, it's not, it's not really moving because there's no seismic activity. Now, if I was to jump on the ground, that would change. So, let me jump up in the air. There it goes, look, look, look. It just moved a little bit. I created a teeny tiny earthquake. This was used up until 2002. It's a planetarium projector. The Zeiss Mark IV, a pair of a thousand watt lamps and star balls of this planetarium instrument projected light onto 32 plates. Each was perforated with one hole for every star's position. It's no longer in use, but it is still here on display. Zooming in now, going into the solar system. The planet's spinning around the sun. This animated diagram really kind of puts things in perspective and helps you understand how it all works out there in space. Okay, it's, oh, it's zooming out. It's zooming way out. Showing the galaxy, our galaxy or our solar system, I should say. Also shows the comparison of size, starting down there with Mercury. See how teeny and tiny it is? And then Venus, Earth, Mars, Jupiter, which is huge in comparison. And the ringed planet of Saturn, Uranus, Neptune, and Pluto, and beyond. Look at teeny tiny Pluto. You can't even see it next to Neptune on that little pillar. You can barely even see Pluto there. Look at that little guy. So, so small in comparison. It's almost like it's hard to even get the depth. It's hard to even get the depth of how, how tiny it is compared to its larger counterparts. Smaller than the other planets. A lot of the objects in Kuiper Belt are too small to form the perfect spheres the way that the other planets have. Um, it, because it is small, it doesn't have enough gravity to carry its own orbit. So it crosses over Neptune's orbit rather than having its own. A sampling of Los Angeles lifestyle in 1976, not to be opened until 2076. This time capsule. It's not underground, it's just sitting here on this little podium. It's like a circular sphere. Wonder what the heck's in there. I never heard of that planet. Catern? Definitely has to be the, the cutest planet of them all. This is Jupiter in stuffed animal form. And there we are. Even though the majority, well, pretty much everything I've showed up to now has been included in the free admission for $7 a couple times a day, you can enter inside the planetarium. Of course, you're not allowed to film in there, and it's an extra charge, but it's a pretty cool experience if you ever get the chance to do it. That's gonna do it for today from Los Angeles, California, the Griffith Observatory. A little bit of an in-depth look on what's inside both levels through the doors of this fantastic, iconic LA attraction slash exhibit hall. I will return here in the future because at night they open up the telescopes on the roof and certain times of the year they do different stargazing events. So we will be here again, rest assured. If you are new here, please subscribe by doing, by doing that. It helps keep you in the loop and up to date on future endeavors that I will be going on and uploads here on this channel. I will see you in the next video. The vlog is over. Okay, I'll stop.